Welcome to Caucus, New Jersey. I'm Steve Adubato. You know, nationwide, nearly 120,000 people are waiting for life-saving transplants. Today, there are still myths surrounding organ and tissue donation process. Today in the studio to help us understand the impact donations can have are John Longo. John and his family donated the organs of his sister, Mary Ann. Dorothea Duffy is awaiting a kidney transplant. Denise People, Peoples is a double lung recipient. And finally, Jay Ariso is the manager of Family Services at New Jersey Sharing Network. I want to thank all of you for joining us. Jay, I want to remind folks that throughout this program, there's going to be a website, your website, and people go on it right now throughout this half hour. What are they going to see? Uh, they're going to be able to get information on our organization, um, just the importance of uh, and the power of organ and tissue donation, and also they, they could even um, register to be a donor on, on our website. They can actually register. Yeah. So interesting. We were on the website right before we came into the program. We saw that you can register. And the other thing that really struck me, there's a section on it. When you go on it, it's terrific. There's a section about myths, right? Mm -hmm. Let's deal with some of the myths right away, right? Uh, by the way, there's a difference between organ donation and tissue donation. Correct. But how about this one? Uh, someone says, oh, my God, if I donate uh, my organs, by the way, on, on your, your driver's license, on mine, and I'm not just saying that for any other reason other than the fact that it's a fact and New Jersey has one of the lowest number, uh, has one of the lowest numbers in the country of people who with their driver's license who check off the box that say they want to donate their organs if, in fact, they're in a position to do that. Yeah. Check it off, by the way. People say, oh, my body could be mutilated during the recovery process of organs and tissues. Not true. Not true. Not true. Mm -hmm. Where do you think that comes from? I don't know where it comes from, but I would say it's uh, probably natural fears that we have as individuals. I can say, having gone through this with my sister Mary Ann, uh, we were able to have an open casket funeral. Uh, it, there was no impact on how we, uh, you know, observed her uh, ceremony and remembrance. It's interesting. Your, your situation, John, everyone's situation is different, but your sister passed at 51 years of age, I believe. Right. Okay. And her husband wanted to do this, but he also wanted it to be a family decision, if That's you right. will. And if I'm wrong in any of this, you'll tell me. Um, um, we're looking at your sister right there. Um, your mom wasn't overly anxious, let's just say, That's right. to do this. But there's a lot of discussion among the family. Sure. A lot of questions about what would happen um, and confusion. Mm -hmm. How did you get the right information as to what was true and what wasn't? Talk about myths, yeah. misconceptions. Go ahead. Yeah, there, uh, New Jersey Sharing Network's uh, representative and the hospital staff at that time uh, were really like angels in taking us through those conversations. It was, uh, to, as you said, it was very confusing. You know, we're, we're dealt with this question at the worst possible time, high emotions. Right. None of us had any knowledge of the topic, and uh, New Jersey sharing reps and, uh, and the hospital staff really took us through the conversations. Uh, we had all the time in the world, uh, not clinically, but <laughs> right. as, as they discussed with us, they, there was never any time pressure and never any pressure at all, in, in fact, to make the decision we did. But we knew that um, if we could present, prevent some other family from going through the loss we were experiencing, it was absolutely the right decision, and we knew Marianne would have wanted that. Yeah, it's interesting. Marianne would have wanted it, but technically, I mean, officially, she never signed anything that right. said she wanted to be a donor. That's right. But you knew. That's right. Uh, we knew because we knew my sister. She was a very loving you and giving heart. person. Exactly. And, uh, you know, I think had she been registered, it probably would have been an easier thing for the family and for my mother. I always encourage people when I speak about donation, uh, always be open for the conversation, tell your loved ones your wishes, and ultimately, if you decide to do that, uh, register. By the way, the reason we're doing this program and a series of others is because we're trying to raise awareness about organ and tissue donation. Go on the website, find out more information. Denise, your story is fascinating as well. You're a double lung recipient. Yes, I am. Uh, 2006. Uh, yeah. Change your life. Describe your life before with oxygen, I believe, 24-7, yeah. and then after. Go ahead. It was like being in a bad marriage. Really. Oh, hold on, I'm sorry. Bring me, bring me back to that. Uh, 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 what was it like again? It's like being in a bad marriage. <laughs> a lot of people watching on yeah. PBS right now going, okay, oh, I'm with you. Right. I mean, you're connected to this tank. It's like my husband, you know. Uh, and, why can't it be a wife? Uh, because I'm a female. It's okay, my I'm husband. Just you know what I mean? but, no, you know, I just it was just like everywhere I went, I had to lug this tank. I mean, it went...
from being able to have a small tank that you like a backpack right you could put it on to as I got sicker I had to have a larger tank that had more oxygen and it was just you know we're talking three four years of carrying this thing around and lugging it around you know but before so, that oh life was wonderful before you were that. doing it all doing it all gym I wanna... traveling have no clue. You were, you're, you're exercising, you're healthy, you're right, doing all, yes. traveling, doing everything, fine. Yes. What happens? All of a sudden, I started getting short of breath. Weren't you a performer? Yes, still am. Even during what kind? Uh, comedy. Comedy. Didn't you yes. dance, dance before? Yes, I did. Is it true that after you got the transplant, you lost some of your rhythm? Yeah. Did you say you got some white guy's rhythm? White I, guy's I'm biracial. Bi that's all I know. <laughs> go ahead. Okay, so yeah. 2006, go ahead. What happened? Well, I had the transplant 2007. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, I had the transplant 2007. But before that, everything was fine. December of um, 2001, I'm coming up the steps. By the way, I'm sorry. Go, go back for a second. Mm -hmm. uh, Georgette Timoney, our producer, just reminded me. We never really clarified. You had pulmonary disease. Yes. Because I don't want to make light of it. Yes. You had serious pulmonary, pulmonary fibrosis. You never smoked. Never smoked. Okay, but you had it. Yes. 2006, 2007. Go ahead. I'm right. sorry. Yes. Apologize. And um, it was pulmonary fibrosis, which is an older white male smoker's disease. I've never smoked, and I think you know the rest. Go ahead. Um, and <laughs> it was idiopathic <laughs> because they didn't know it how. What? Idiopathic. That means the doctors don't know how you got it. That's basically what it means. Idiopathic. Okay, so mm -hmm. then that happens. Begin mm -hmm. to describe what happens in your life. Uh, things start to slow down. Yeah. Drastically. Yeah. They start slowing down. You kind of start to learn how to live with it because you're waiting. Yeah. So you have to learn how to live. And you, unless you're going to just sit and just, you know, let it take you, take over, you got to learn how to live. I kept doing comedy. I would... Uh, decorate my cannula, you know, for the oxygen mm. with rhinestones and mm. go out and do comedy and you just had to live. Now, every day wasn't good, but the days that were good, but I was today? able to laugh. Oh, today is wonderful. Uh, yep. And today is great. I'm doing 5Ks. I just did one last week. You're running. Yep. Running and walking 5Ks. Wow. And, and, and Dorothy, I, I, mm, I almost feel, well, I do feel very uncomfortable even asking you right now. How hard is it for you to listen to Denise right now? Because um, you've been on a transplant list. Is it two or two and a half years? Two and a half. Is it hard for you to listen? No, it's hopeful. Go ahead, talk. Describe I... your situation. Um, you have a very rare autoimmune disease that affects your vascular and respiratory system. Correct. On a transplant list for that period of time, a couple of years. Um, you're waiting for a kidney. Waiting for a kidney. I'm listed in two clinics. Uh, one in Pennsylvania and Philly, and one at St. Barnabas. Now on dialysis. I'm on dialysis three days a week. What's and, that like? Um, kind of um, understand exactly what Denise said. You accept your life as it is for now, right. and you make the best of it. Um, it's something I know I have to do. And my main, one of my main goals is staying as healthy as I can, so I'm ready for that kidney when it comes available. And uh, I stay as compliant as I can. There's diets that you have to stay on, mm. um, fluid restriction, which people mm. can't even believe that you have to, you can only drink so much a day. Um, and I, I just. After I, I every year I look back and I see how far I've come. I've yeah. gotten I've gotten better and I've been able to handle things better. Um, I feel stronger. I started doing the 5K walk with New Jersey Sharing Network three years ago. Yeah, they have a big 5K. Really and um, this this is our third year and mm -hmm. I had I've had teams the past two years and a lot of support. A lot of support Emotional. and. That's one of the main things that I have to say is, is keeping me hopeful and encouraging me to not to give up. I'm not, I would never give up. I'm not a give up person. Mm -hmm. But the support that I received all the way through from the very beginning when I was first sick mm -hmm. and um, having to go to the hospital and then being in the hospital for a month.
me, friends, family, coworkers, um, the, the support I got. I, I have to. I have to be strong because those people were strong right. for me. You are very confident and hopeful that you will get this kidney. Yes, I am. Jed, let me ask you, this is important, isn't it? It's very important. How many people are waiting? Over 110,000 in the country are waiting. In the state, over 5,000 people are waiting on the list. And, and talk about the emotional and psychological piece of this. Yeah. Because, a lot of, because I, I would argue not a lot of people are as healthy and positive and are doing all the right things in the way it is. Yeah. I mean, the way I try to describe it is um, it's every day waking up wishing and, and most likely praying that God mm -hmm. gives you a second chance to life. Um, it's, it's scary, I'm pretty sure. I mean, I've, I, I can't speak for you, but I can, um, I can imagine um, when I speak to many other recipients um, or the people that are waiting on the list, how they feel. And, um, I, you know, I, I think the conversations like this give you hope mm -hmm. right, to be able to see. They do. Yeah. So it's funny. My first reaction was that must be hard to hear such a positive description of before and after. And you're saying, no, no, quite the contrary. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. so interesting. That's how I feel. I, I feel that uh, listening to someone like Denise positive gives me yeah and, and for you definitely hope because you, your sister Marianne helped a couple people right yes yeah, she was able to um, uh, they, were, they were able to transplant uh, both kidneys and her liver into three men did you interact with any of those family members uh, any of those those people the recipients and any other family members we've um, we've been in contact with one of her kidney recipients yeah Mm. Right now, people watching, say someone's moved by you, by you, by you. They appreciate what you and your organization, you know, what, what you do. But they say, oh, not me. Not me. It's just, it's just not me. I, I, I can't imagine doing it, you know. Plus, uh, you know, um, I, just, I just can't see it for me. In my family, you say? There is no greater gift than the gift of life. Just think about that. Think about my loved one is going or gone. What can I do to keep them alive? What do you mean keep them alive? Whoever my donor was is still living. And when I meet that person's family, they're going to feel something special because I'm breathing, because their loved one is inside of me. Do you know the story? Uh, help me on this. Uh, Georgette, help me on this. Um, I don't know, uh, one of our producers, if I get this wrong. Do you know the story, um, the young man, we feature this on, um, we feature this on our sister uh, program on NJ Today, Ryan's Heart. Ryan was a young man um, at, I believe, Montclair State University in the media program there. He um, needed a heart, and I believe he was at Beth, Beth Israel Hospital in Newark, mm -hmm. suffering for a long time, needed a heart. He was, he was dying. Mm -hmm. And long story short, there, he was on a list, and there was a heart that became available. He was, I think, 16, or excuse me, 17 or 18 years of age, and a heart became available in Jamaica. I'm pretty sure it was in Jamaica, and he flew, the family flew over there. Do you know the story I'm talking about? I've heard of it. And he was a soccer player here, and it was a soccer player over there, uh, who wore the same number? That's amazing. Oh. It's a true story. And and um, Ryan, who was a documentarian, video documentarian, went and filmed it, and he met this young man's father. And the young man's father, whom he met, looked at him, held him, and said, "I feel like a piece of my son is in you, and I feel like, on some level, you are my son." Yeah. Now. You know, I was sitting there watching and thinking, you know, did you, you know, on some level, you watch a documentary on like that and you ask yourself the question, what do you think most people's reaction to that is? Do they say, oh, wow, that's really powerful, it's very emotional? But do they think that's some sort of special story or could that be them? I, it could be them. I, I think that um, people might react both ways, like you were saying. What's some, both ways? Some people might take it as, um, oh, this is awesome, this is great. And some people might say, okay, this is awesome, this is great, but it's just not for me. 
Um, but I always try to share that you can never lose with generosity. What do you mean? You know, when all else fails, generosity always wins. Um, it, it could be that you're in the most difficult, most darkest moment of your life, and family that make this decision, like like his family, right? Uh, in the most darkest moment of their life, um, they open the chapter to save somebody else, um, which th there's no way to lose in that. Right. Um, so here's my other question. In terms of educating people, they ask the question, so there's organ donation and then there's tissue donation. Okay. Well, there's a difference. What's the difference? With organ donation, uh, we're, we're talking about heart, lungs, uh, kidneys, pancreas, uh, liver. With tissue donation, we're talking about skin donation. We're talking about bone, corneas, veins. Um, and each one of them have a, a direct and powerful impact on, on the people that are going to receive it. Uh, for example, in cornea donation, well, you give the gift of sight. I have, I have a few friends that have actually been recipients of the cornea transplant, uh, from a cornea transplant, and they, for years, weren't able to see. Um, one of them, um, he got married and wasn't able to see for years. He, was, he had mm. a lot of trouble. And after his cornea transplant, uh, just a few months ago, he was able to see his firstborn child clearly, um, something that he wouldn't have been able to do if he wouldn't have got that chance. So giving the gift of sight is so powerful. Sight. Yeah. Why do you think it is that so few in New Jersey, I mean, we, we just did a program of volunteers and where so many people were, we say New Jersey is a very giving state. And that's true in terms of volunteer hours. But so few New Jerseyans actually sign their license and say, if I'm in a position to donate, and we'll talk about it in a second, who's a candidate and who's not. But New Jersey is one of the states that has the lowest number of recipients, excuse me, donor candidates. Why do you think that is? I think people just don't understand. Um, so you can give the gift of sight, of right. life, of... Exactly. And the myths. People believe yeah. in these crazy myths. Yeah. Of religious reasons and this, you know... What, that I can't have an open casket if I do oh, it? Yeah. It's also they, a myth, they right? They really That's think that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then there's, you know, you see some of these shows that show it in a different light. Yeah. Where, what do you mean? Oh, the show, there was one show uh, where they were... Um, people were stealing organs and ripping people apart. So untrue. That makes it even harder. Yeah. Yes. You were going to jump yes. in. Go ahead. Yeah, I think one of the biggest myths is um, people's fear that if something happens to me, they're right. going to see I'm a registered donor and they're just going to let me go. Oh, yeah, right. let's talk about that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get inferior health care. Right. right. And they're going to make less of an effort to save me because I've signed that card. Right. Go ahead. I, I can say only from my personal experience with my sister, I am 100% confident that everything possible was done to try to save Marianne. So I know that. I know that factually. I know that in my heart. I was there. And um, I know that that will be, unfortunately, a reality for uh, many of us, uh, all of us eventually, right? So I think the question is less about uh, it should be less about that myth mm. that somebody's not going to take care of me and more about the things we were talking about earlier around if something or when something bad happens to me, what do I want to leave behind as my legacy? Do I want to help others? That's the question. Yeah. That should be the question. I think it should. And if you're going to decide not to donate your organs, then do it based on the facts, not based on incorrect right. information, That's right? Right. That's right. Exactly. right. Exactly. right. Yeah. Exactly. What's the message you want to share with people watching right now? I mean, obviously, we're all rooting for you. You've waited a long time. You're doing a lot of the right things, if not all the right things, right? Mm -hmm. What's the message you want people to know as they look at that information on the sharing network right now? What's the message you want to share, Dorothy? Um, well, one of the things was to, it, you don't have to wait till your license has to be renewed. What do you mean you don't have to wait? Isn't that how I communicate? Or can you go on the site right you now? You can go right on the site. You can go right on the site and... As a matter of fact, I'm one of those people. I, being that I was waiting for a, a kidney, thought that I could not be an organ donor. Another myth. Another myth. And so, just this past summer, I went on the site and I signed up. I didn't wait for my license to be renewed. Mm. And I don't wait. You don't have to wait. If you, if you think that that's what you want to do, don't wait. Do it now. Jay, jump in. By the way, speaking of myths, it's so interesting. I said to you before that my wife 
did it, and you know, uh, she was concerned that if she did it, she wouldn't be able to come become pregnant. Mm -hmm. She believed that myth, not a fact, right? Right. Because she was able to, and that's how we have a daughter. But go ahead. Yeah, and you know, one of those myths also is religious. With um, Denise had brought up the religion, religious myth. Yeah, the religious myths where um, your religion doesn't allow it. And the truth is that all major religions believe that donation is something good. Don't you great. bring clergy into it? Yeah, we do. Talk we... about the role of clergy from the sharing network's perspective. How do you bring them in to the process? Because a lot of people involved in that group, right? Yeah, yeah. And we and we have an out faith-based outreach where we'll connect with clergy in the community um, to raise, raise awareness in their faith-based community. We have Donor Sabbath in November, which is a, a month national initiative for mm. uh, faith-based communities to speak about the power of donation in their uh, faith-based communities and their churches and synagogues and temples. Well, let me ask you a question. So just play this out for a second. The hospital, it doesn't matter what hospital it is. It could be any hospital anywhere across the state, right? They call you Yep. They call the sharing network. What happened? So they call in a referral, and um, at that point uh, they'll call uh, they'll call in and say this person um, is a potential can be a potential donor. Right. Uh, and then because they don't know for sure. Uh, right. And then uh, we will evaluate ourselves. We go to the hospital and we will evaluate. And at that point, um, through the process, we um, we get involved with the family. We're the ones to speak with the family. We support emotionally and spiritually with the family all through the whole process of donation. What are you looking at? How do because a very small percentage of those who is interesting of all potential candidates how many are actual donors you know people that are able to be donors is actually a small window right it's actually but, less than one percent but but why do we want so many to register to be donors if such a small percentage someone may say well if the odds are so low then why should I register because if if we don't have every single right. person putting on their license there's no way that we're going to be able to save all the people that we so have. So what are you list. looking at to determine that? We have to move the whole state to go out there and put and register to be donors. No, no, what are you looking at in terms of determining whether someone is in fact a, a, a an appropriate donor, a, a viable donor or not? Oh, is there's blood type. What else is? Yeah, there's blood types. There, uh, when they're, they, there's various tests that will be done, blood tests that will be done at the hospital. Um, but what we try to motivate people is let us evaluate. Sign it. Put it on your license. Let us be the one. Don't don't make the, ch the choice yourself. Oh, I'm too sick. I can't do it. They don't know. They don't know. And you know, it's it's it's. Uh, let it, leave it up to us. But put it on your license so that you can give. The, we could open that window up and have the chance to save more people. Because what did you know? At that you time, guys didn't know. No, we didn't. We didn't have any real knowledge. Uh, the only thing organ donation meant to me at that point in my life was I knew I checked the box on my driver's mm -hmm. license 20 years ago and never thought about it. Bring the story um, full circle. Because in many ways, the biggest reason we had you here was to share your individual stories. Yeah. I mean, again, the facts and figures are great, but your stories, to me, are the reason why I wanted to do this. Another member of your family at some point, I believe your brother-in-law, needed an organ. Yep. Talk uh, about it. Just like Denise. Uh, my <laughs> oddly enough, my brother-in-law, Aldo, uh, on my wife's side of the family, uh, had the same illness, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. <sighs> And 10 months after we lost my sister, um, Aldo became a double lung recipient. And so while I think some individuals will have that hesitancy around, is this for me? I, I like things the way they are. It's not for me. Uh, you never know how your family's thrust into this on one end or the other. If I can, well, I don't want to, if he's not in a position to share, I understand. Is he still, what's the situation? He's doing great. He's, you know, living life as a father, husband, mm -hmm. grandfather. He's back to work. He's okay. doing everything normal. And only a few seconds left. You look great. Thank you. You're a terrific guest on this show. I know you've motivated and inspired many people. And um, last thing you want to say to people. Um, I keep the faith mm -hmm. and have faith in those people that are waiting. Um, because uh, I know there'll be someone out there and I know someone will probably be at a loss but it'll be something that will be good for me um, that's that's a little yeah. difficult sometimes to to get a handle on we're rooting for you and you all did a great public service thank you very much the preceding program has been a production of the caucus educational corporation celebrating 25 years of broadcast excellence and 13 for WNET, NJTV, and WHYY.
Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by New Jersey Sharing Network, Barnabas Health, Wells Fargo, New Jersey Manufacturers Insurance Group, New Jersey Natural Gas, and by Qualcare Inc. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. Caucus New Jersey has been produced in partnership with TriStar Studios. This program has been made possible in part by the New Jersey Institute.